beginning, when all flying was by visual contact with the ground. Navigation wasn't much of a problem. You just followed the river or the railroad tracks. And if you got lost, you set her down on any open patch and asked directions. In the 1920s, the first passenger-carrying airline service began. Even for these pioneers, getting lost was frowned on by both company and passengers. To avoid that embarrassment, the first aids to navigation were established. A series of light beacons on the New York-Chicago run, set up by the Department of Commerce in 1926. Aviation was growing up, expanding, and the public recognized the need to help it grow. A short time later, the federal government began construction of low-frequency radio range and communication stations. The first established air navigational aids came into use. After World War II, air navigation took a big step forward with new frequency bands, new equipment, and a much more flexible method, the Omni, or VOR. The chart from the shows the beginning of the VOR airway system, nine stations, New York to Chicago. These early stations each had a different frequency, but the number of available frequencies is limited. As the system grew, it became necessary to assign a single frequency to more than one station. At this time, an important problem developed. Above a certain altitude, these two stations interfere with each other. They can be used only at lower altitude levels. Stations without an interference problem could be used at higher altitudes. More and more VORs were needed as the volume of air traffic increased. The problem of interference became severe. Some new technique was needed. The solution was to limit the low altitude airways and to establish a separate jet route structure. In 1961, the idea was carried a step further when the intermediate airway structure was added. The plan called for use of the L, M, or H navvies at the lower levels, M and H in the intermediate structure, and only the H navvies in the jet route structure. At the time, this three-level structure seemed the only way to cope with the interference problem. Yet, it had undesirable features. Pilots found that flight planning was often more complex and transitions more complicated. Extra charts were required and more frequency changes, both for navigation and communications. It was better on the controls of two for much the same reason. The Federal Aviation Agency recognized the problems and immediately began a study to see if a better solution could be found. Still, the same conditions had to be met. The limited number of frequencies must be assigned so that VORs will not interfere with one another. The answer FAA found was an improved airway route system, effective in the fall of 1964. Here are the details of this new system. The Victor airway structure extends from the base of the associated controlled airspace up to, but not including, 18,000 feet MSL. The jet route system extends from flight level 180 to flight level 450 inclusive. The airspace above flight level 450 is available for random operations. No routes or airways are established. The signal from each nav aid is free of interference out to a specified distance. For L nav aids, the distance is 40 nautical miles. 
In some cases, a greater distance is provided for longer airway segments. Aircraft at jet route altitudes use only the H nav aids. They have an interference free radius of 130 nautical miles. The H nav aids can also be used by aircraft operating above flight level 450, but 100 miles is the limit of the interference free area. At certain times, the lower flight levels cannot be used. To understand why this restriction is necessary, consider this flight on a Victor airway as it heads into an area of lower pressure. The pilot corrects his altimeter to the reduced barometric pressure, and he maintains the assigned altitude. But this pilot, on flight level 180, keeps his altimeter set at standard pressure. The low pressure area causes the altimeter reading to increase, since this instrument is a pressure sensitive device. The pilot would correct by descending to maintain his assigned flight level. The vertical separation would become less than a thousand feet when the pressure dropped below 2992. To avoid this, flight level 180 is not used when the pressure is below standard. The same restriction applies to flight level 190 when the pressure drops below 2892. Flight level 200 can generally be assigned since the pressure rarely falls low enough to make a restriction necessary. An adjustment table is used to determine minimum safe altitude where terrain is a factor. Closely related to the airway route system, the question of lateral separation. How much airspace should be flat? The answer was arrived at in the following way. When an aircraft is a long distance from the nav aid, the deviation from course center line may be as much as several miles. This can be caused by three things. The signal from the nav aid, even when it's operating within the design tolerance, may vary slightly from the ideal. There may also be slight variations in the aircraft's navigation receivers. Or the pilot may not be keeping his indicator exactly centered. The deviation that may be caused by these three factors increases with distance from the nav aid. Studies and computations by the FAA have shown that the maximum deviation is normally within 4.5 degrees on either side of the course center line. In the low level structure, the standard airway width is eight nautical miles, although six miles is used in some cases. However, 51 miles from the nav aid, the aircraft's deviation may be as much as four nautical miles from the center line. So, beyond this distance from the nav aid, the airway is widened in accordance with the 4.5 degree angles. As you've probably noticed already, distances in the new system are given in nautical miles. This change is being made to conform to international usage. For a comparison, the former airway width, 10 statute miles, was just slightly greater than the new 8 nautical mile width. The new airway route structure has quite a few benefits. One of them involves every taxpayer. Quite a few new and other nav aids were scheduled for installation in the coming years. Now they will not be needed. The saving is estimated at some $28 million. Pilots get immediate benefit from the new changes in a number of direct ways. For short and medium range trips, the flight planning is simpler. Because the low altitude airways extend up to 18,000 instead of 14,5, flights like this one remain within a single altitude structure. Most clearances are simply two, especially when they involve transitioning. And the entire set of intermediate level charts is a thing of the past.
Just that much less snow in the cockpit. For the aircraft, whether commercial or private, no additional equipment is needed. But private pilots should be especially careful to keep their charts up to date. This is important because quite a few nav aid frequencies and a number of Victor Airways will be changed during the next few months. The latest information should be checked before starting on a cross country. Earlier, it was mentioned that nav aid signals are free of interference within the specified radius. However, until all the necessary frequency changes have been made, you may occasionally get slight interference from some stations on direct operations. This is an interim condition which will be fully resolved after about the middle of 1965. The change in structure affects controllers too in several ways. Some sectors will be reconfigured to balance the workloads. To accommodate these shifts, extensive changes have already been made in interphone and radio channel terminations. In many cases, the amount of coordination necessary for clearances is reduced, especially for transitioning aircraft. Because the system of intermediate airways is being dropped, radar sectors benefit by having some of the video mapping removed from the scopes. The 1964 modification of the airway rule system was designed with three goals in mind. Simplification, needs of the users, and best use of the limited number of air nav frequencies, with minor changes and improvements that will be made to the system as required. It will well serve the needs of future aircraft and increasing volumes of air traffic. 